Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Some have asked me to do a special study on law and grace, so I thought we'd look a little more closely at the subject. I just asked you to roll back every thought in your mind and listen because, first of all, this is spiritual. And I want to begin by saying that I was just a, real, a little bit surprised at the request that I conduct this study because it seems to me that every message on this channel is a study on law and grace. And so about all I can do is sort of recap what I've always done in looking at this subject. However, I thought we might start by defining terms. It is very, very important that we understand what we mean when we use certain words. I believe it's important that when we use words, we pour the right meaning into those words. And when I use words in this evening, in our study of law and grace, I'd like to take just a moment that I can make sure that you understand what I mean. It, because it may not mean, may not be what you mean when you use the word or words. Law is a system. It's a code of regulations, which if disobeyed, result in penalty. Legalism is not law. Legalism is an attitude of self-merit, of human merit based upon human actions, and includes a penalty if the wrong actions are Pursued. Now, those are pretty simple definitions, but you know they're what I'm going to use uh, this evening. Grace, on the other hand, is a word which is indefinable, separate from the Word of God. All grace can mean, if you do not take scriptural meanings, is is favorableness, uh, nice attitude. Uh, sweetness, uh, you know, I don't know, graciousness. In fact, we define grace as a gracious attitude, and that almost seems like uh, uh, circular uh, reasoning, circular definition. Grace to the Bible student, to the new creation in Christ Jesus, grace to you and I is a concept, an attribute of God, which led Him to provide the complete basis of our redemption and our oneness with Him, it is an attribute that led him to do this absolutely separate from anything in us. There was no merit. There was no activity. There was nothing in us which led God to do this. Such a definition of grace is absolutely unique to Christianity. And it should be clearly pointed out if you are not a member of the body of Christ then, well, what is said is meaningless to you. Now, legalism uh, is the greatest enemy of the Christian church and has been ever since the days of Christ. No other concept is as devastating to biblical truth as the legalistic concept. Many teach today that we are still under God's law in some form or the other, that we are still in one way or another under the law. I want to tell you that grace is the watershed of systematic theology. Grace is that concept which divides Christian thought. For example, the Romanist approach uh, to grace is that it is mediated through a priest and through the sacraments. The Arminian concept of grace is that it's an attribute of God which cooperates with man. The liberal view of grace is that man reaches a position of grace apart from any activity from God, that he basically, basically just does it all on his own. Grace, on the other hand, biblically, biblically, is that attribute which totally provides a complete basis upon which God can redeem His people. If we look then at law in contrast to grace, I'm going to take you through the book of Galatians. This is what we're studying on Sunday morning. Uh, take you through the, 
some passages there primarily, and I don't know, I don't know that you want to turn to all of these, but if you just stick with with it, you know, we can this we can handle uh, most of it. However, my my very first reference will be to John chapter one. You you don't uh, need to turn there. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You all know the passage. If we look at it in the Greek, the law was given by Moses, but grace came into being. Grace and truth came into being by means of Jesus Christ. And so one of the earliest references we have to the grace of God indicates that it is inseparable from the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So don't even talk to me about grace unless you want to talk talk about unless you're talking about his person and his work. Now your authorized version says the grace and the truth came by Jesus Christ. The Greek says it came into being by means of Jesus Christ. And so the basis of all of our relationship to God is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And the question that's before us is not so much are we still under, you know, some or all of the law, but the question is what kind of a job did Jesus Christ really do for us? You know, for those of you who are hyper dispensationalists, you know, I don't mean to shock you, but to look at the Word of God just casually, I believe it is absolutely apparent, even to the simplest of readings, that God has divided human history at least into three major time periods, each of which begins with an event which transforms world history. I've mentioned this on several occasions in other studies. There was, first of all, the age of law when Israel was delivered from bondage in Egypt. Egypt was destroyed. You know, it doesn't mean much to you because, well, you know, the modern uh, newscaster on TV and radio needs something to up to date, you know, with which to shock you. But believe me, back then it was headline news when the armies of Egypt were drowned in the Dead Sea, the Red Sea. Okay, uh, Egypt was the world power at the time. Egypt was not. Uh, uh, and then all of a sudden, well, they were not the world power. And after God delivered the children of Israel from bondage in e Egypt, it's very, very clear that that delivery was from bondage. Bondage, okay? And that God absolutely, God absolutely provided for them. They were not out there hoeing and raking in the desert to raise potatoes and onions so that they could live. God absolutely provided for them. He met their needs. It wasn't, uh, well, God helps those who help themselves, you know. You know, why is this Israelite starving? Well, he's not gathering any water, you know, that he can from, all, from the dew and, and, and watering a little patch of uh, a sand so that, you know, his potatoes would grow so he could live. Nobody did that. And for 40 years, God absolutely provided for his people, Israel separate from their effort. They couldn't raise anything. They couldn't drill any wells. They couldn't get any water, but they drank and they ate. There weren't any uh, shopping centers. There was no Amazon, okay? Uh, the shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. God did it, and we had the age of law. We had the age of law. The major definition of that period of human history was that if you do this, I will bless you, said God. And that age ended with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was a world-transforming, history-transforming event. You know, if you don't think so, then, well, you're really not thinking. You know, because when you mention the date, you mention the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you speak of history, you mention Christ. When you hear political speeches, uh, judges making comments, uh, songs written, uh, mystery stories written, uh, television programs, it, it is impossible that, that you can't hear at least insidious references to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We divided history into that which was before Christ and that which is after Christ. And if we insist that there is no Lord, that there is no God, well, we're still tied to that world transforming event which says 2024 is, 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 the, is the year of the Lord and with the death, burial, and resurrection came the second major period of human history. That period which God calls grace, that, that period can more easily be characterized as, as since you have been so completely and totally blessed, then go and do. Under law, if you did, you were blessed. If you did not, you paid a penalty. Under grace, you have been completely, totally blessed, blessed with everything all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus, every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. If you believe that by doing something, God will bless you more, you are faced with a statement of Scripture that He has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. He's already done that. He can't bless you any more than He has. Dearly beloved. And so the truth is, since we've been totally blessed, we go forth and we do. But if we don't do, if we don't do, there is no penalty. Grace begins with total blessing and it ends with no penalty. And it is a unique period in human history. Unique. Under that period of law, there were uh, laws given which were perfect, but no power given to keep them. Under the period of grace, there are no laws given and total, total power, total enablement because we're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Now under the kingdom age, the law will be reestablished, but it will be reestablished with enablement. God says, I will write my laws upon their hearts and I will put them in their minds. But it just so happens that you and I, by God's design, have been born into that period of time where there is no law, no regulation, no penalty, and total enablement. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Amazing. It is, Im it is impossible, folks, in any study of the Word of God to establish any way in which you could lose the Holy Spirit or that in any way that the Holy Spirit would, could or would depart from you. In the book of Galatians, we find that the law brings into bondage anybody who is teaching legalism today. And let me tell you, that is over 95% of all the churches who gathered to meet this week. In, in one way or another, they are enslaving, they are putting your brothers and sisters in Christ in bondage. You know, you people haven't given enough, you haven't sacrificed enough, you haven't led enough souls to Christ. Well, Pastor Steve, you know, you have one job on earth, and that's to save souls. Well, that's going to put me under some bondage because I don't know that I've ever saved any and I'm at the age, you know, you're now, you know, you're on social security and you look forward to death and folks, if I haven't saved any by now, I'm in real trouble. Most of Christianity today is dedicated in one way or another to burden the hearer so that he'll do more. That is absolutely a violation of grace. They came that they might bring us into slavery. The law enslaves. That's the first thing I want you to realize. The law enslaves. Legalism enslaves the recipient. He is now the slave of human performance. He's now the slave of human merit. That world religious system based on human merit. We've been looking in our Sunday study in Galatians chapter 2, the 16th verse We've been looking at the fact that we absolutely know, we know, that's a perfect active participle, we know, we absolutely know 
We've even known it in past time with the result that we eternally know that a man cannot, cannot be justified by means of the works of the law, but by means of, of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. For by the works of the law there shall no man be justified. Therefore, the law cannot show one to be righteous. And you say, oh, I've, I've never broken any laws. Therefore, I'm righteous. No, no. That doesn't mean you're righteous. It means that nobody's caught you in breaking any law yet. And when you do break one, all of the keeping that you've done has been nullified. Folks, the law cannot justify. The law cannot show you to be righteous. Galatians 2.19, For I through the law am dead to the law in order that I might live unto God. I've used that verse many a times in our study uh, studies over the years. It, it's a very important concept for you to, to grasp, uh, for you to comprehend. The legalist says, well, if you live well unto God, you know, you attend church Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and if you're really spiritual, Wednesday night, you know, and if you tithe a tenth of your income and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, if you do all of those things, then God's gonna, God will bless you. And you'll gain merit with God. Where are you living at? Well, you're living, to, you're living to self. If you have not died to the law, you cannot live unto God. That's the devastating side effect of legalism. Here you are, one redeemed by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are absolutely unable to live unto God unless you've died to the law. That concept is so important. You know, a good Christian does this, doesn't do that. You know, where do I look? Where, where am I looking? I'm looking at the do's and the don'ts. I know that most of the Christians I meet would be thrilled if you could hand them a handbook. So, you know, these are the things good Christians do and these are the things that, that good Christians don't do. You know, and... And what's happening here, folks? What is happening? They're spending all their time looking at rules and not looking at Christ. If I don't die to the law, I can't live unto God. What a, what a terrible thought to walk through life unable to live un, unto the God who made me righteous. Made me righteous. Look at the 21st verse of the second chapter of Galatians. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Now that's, that's my authorized version. The Greek says, I do not set aside God's grace. For if righteousness could have come by the law, then Christ's death was in vain. Alright, so if I go back to legalism, I set aside the grace of God. The very thing the legalist says he's not doing is what he's doing. I am, re I am replacing the grace of God with the human merit system in my life. If your life is lived by the do's and the don'ts, you're in the merit system. If it's lived by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's in the grace system. My Bible says if I go to the legalistic system, I set aside God's grace. We read... Uh, a little bit later on, you are fallen from grace. Fallen from grace. Had a dear, a beloved brother message me about that. Falling from that doesn't mean, grace doesn't mean committing sin. All right, you know, you, you, you fall down. You fall from grace to law. Falling from grace is not committing sin. Falling from grace is falling uh, to law. From grace to law, to legalism. Look at the fifth verse. He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you. Does he do this by the works of the law? And the anticipated answer is no. Or does he do it by the hearing of faith? And the answer is yes. And what I want you to see is that legalism does not minister the Spirit. The very thing I need I cannot get from legalism. Because I, I've dropped from the realm of the Spirit to the realm of the flesh. It does not minister the Spirit. 
chapter 3, verse 10, Galatians 3, 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Okay? So if I have fallen back to the legalistic system, I'm now under the curse. What a terrible thought. Me, for whom there is no curse, am under the curse. And I have by my own choice decided I prefer to walk under the curse. The law, legalism, places us under a curse. 3.12, the law is not of faith. Legalism, which is an outgrowth of law, cannot come from trust, from, but from obedience, from merit. So that legalistic attitude is not from faith. Verse 18 of chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise. If I go back to the legalistic system, I have no inheritance now. Cain didn't want it. No, it was Esau who sold his birthright. Esau sold his birthright. He didn't want his inheritance. And, and surely the account makes it clear that that wasn't an honorable thing to do. You know, what he said basically was, you know, I don't care what my dad is destined for me. I don't want it. And that's, that's what legalism, that's what it, that's what legalism says. It provides no inheritance. The 21st verse is devastating. Is the, is the law against the promise of God? God forbid. May it never be. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, then without question, righteousness would have been by the law. Clearly, you can't read that statement without agreeing that law and legalism, that, that is an outgrowth of, of the law, cannot, cannot, cannot give life. Why should I walk among the dead folks when I'm alive in Christ? It, it, it cannot give life. Look at the 23rd verse. Before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up from the faith which should afterwards be revealed. The law and legalism which stems from the law shuts us up from God. You know, it, it imprisons us. We who have been set free decide that it would be better for us to be back in prison. Shut up under the faithfulness which should afterwards be revealed. And so the law guards us, bars us, seals us from the faithfulness of God. The 24th verse. <coughs> Wherefore the law was our child trainer until Christ came that we might be justified out of that faith. Therefore the law is immature. It's not only immature in the 24th verse, of the third chapter. It's immature in the first through the fourth verses of the fourth chapter. The heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were immature, were in bondage under the elements of the world, which were the law, to redeem them that were under the law. Verse 5, and so legalism is immature. It's immature. We have the same thing in the ninth verse of the 8th chapter of Hebrews. You know, when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, you know, the concept in, in that verse is not that I dragged them forcefully, but I led them as a father leads a child. And so we have the immaturity of the legalistic system. The third verse of the fourth chapter, even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, if the elements of the world bothers you because the Christian mind's been conditioned to, to believe that well, you know, I, I, yeah, I know what the world is. The world is, that's rock music, painted toenails, movies, dancing, drinking, smoking, God knows what. But that is not a biblical definition, folks. All right, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Verse 5, 
to redeem them that were in bondage under the law. The world system is the legal system, the legalistic system that keeps us in bondage. Legalism binds up. It does not set free. It cannot set free. It is a system of bondage. This is how the, world, the word world is used in the context. The ninth verse, 4-9. But now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, why would ye turn back to that which is weak and that which is beggarly? The word beggarly means poor. This is not the only verse where we know the weakness of the law. Romans 8, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did. And so we see that the law is weak. Legalism stemming from the law is weak and poor. What a choice to make when we're children of the king. I could give you more verses which indicate that the law was, was that which is carnal and fleshly. So the law, legalism, is of the flesh, but we are of the spirit. What a, what a tremendous step to, to step from the realm of the Spirit into the realm of the flesh. Look at the fifth chapter of Galatians, verse, verses 2, 3, and 4. Behold I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's now, he is now in slavery. He's a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect. Whosoever of you who, who are attempting to be justified by law, that's what it says, who try to be justified by law, ye are fallen from grace. Therefore, legalism nullifies the work of Christ. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Verse 2, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Legalism, an attempt to please God by human merit, reduces to nothing the finished work of Jesus Christ. If I say, folks, eternal life equals the finished work of Jesus Christ plus whatever you do, plus anything, my effort, my faithfulness, my acceptance, my baptism, you name it, if there's any plus in the equation, then... then one would have to agree that the constant in the equation is the finished work of Christ plus a variable. If the variable isn't there, then I don't have eternal life. Eternal life equals the finished work of Christ plus something I do. And if I don't do that, I don't have eternal life. Therefore, the finished work of Christ amounts to nothing. If there's anything added to the finished work of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ equals zero. Zero. If that's not clear, then the problem is, is my way of explaining it. Legalism, any basis of human merit, reduces to zero the finished work of Jesus Christ. If you, if you said eternal life equals the finished work of Christ plus clipping your toenail... If, you know, if you didn't clip your toenail, you wouldn't have eternal life. Therefore, what Christ did amounted to nothing. Now, that ought to be clear to everybody. Christ profits you nothing. If there's legalism involved, any human merit nullifies the work of Christ in your life. In the 18th verse of the 5th chapter, Since ye are led... Okay, of the Holy Spirit, of the Spirit, you are not under the law. No, Pastor Steve, you can't, you can't tell me that someone who, you know, anyone who committed uh, premeditated murder would go to heaven. And I say, what, you mean like David? You know, and then they always get mad at me. Good people get mad people who listen to too many ministers and too little of the Word. Dearly blood, we're not under law. 
not under the human merit system. If I'm not under law, there's no penalty. Why can't people see that? If you do this, I will do this, says the law. And I, and I don't want you to pick up sticks. Man picks up sticks. You know, Moses, what do we do to this guy? I don't know. He didn't, he didn't do much. He just picked up sticks. I'll ask God. God says, kill him. Now, wait a minute. It's not a capital crime. He just picked up sticks. No, kill him. Folks, grace says walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And I suddenly say, well, wow, I don't, I don't do that very well. What's the penalty? And I, and I looked and I looked and I looked and I can't find any penalty. Law is defined as that code of regulations which carries a penalty for non-performance. If it doesn't carry any penalty, it's a farce of a law. You know, it's, it's illegal, at least in my, where I live, it's illegal to go up, up and down the highway at 80 miles an hour. What if I do nothing? But you shouldn't do it. That's not law. That, law is that which carries a penalty for non-performance. We are to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we were called. There are no penalties in grace. None. Because you're not under law. My loving Heavenly Father exhorts me not to lie. Lie not one to another. The Bible says that. But it's not law. Why? Because it doesn't carry a penalty. Well, what if I do lie? What if I lie? How many ministers are going to stand up and say, well, if you do lie, it doesn't make any difference. It, do, it doesn't from the law standpoint, folks. You may have a fellowship problem with your father, but it'll be your problem, not his. You're not under law. You're under grace. Therefore, that which leads to penalty is removed. It's removed. That's, we, we read that in Colossians 3, 3, 9, Lie not one to another seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds and you put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. If we look at the 18th through the 26th verses of chapter 5 in the book of Galatians, we suddenly see that in verse 18 that the Spirit cannot lead you if you are under law. If you're operating your life under any code of regulations, any legalism which stems from rules and regulations, then you can't be led by the Spirit. Because the 18th verse clearly says that if you are led of the Spirit, then you're not under any of those things. You know, we have commands, we have imperatives in the Word of God, but what the Holy Spirit is saying is this is where law works. This is where legalism works. And this is what Christ in you does. But the Spirit, He works in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, faith, and so forth. And again, there's no law there. And we were just told up in the 18th verse that led of the Spirit, you're not under the law, all the devastating effects of legalism. Legalism, which stems from laws, the area of verses 19, 19 through 21, that's where it is, and it's the human merit system. Legalism is an attitude based on human merit, and it only functions in that area. You know, it's a dirty, filthy area. It, it can't, can't function. It can't function in the sphere of the Spirit. Devastating that we'd take that which we thought was good when really it's destroying us. Many years ago, I was in the VA hospital and I was recovering from a back injury. And my roommate was there because of a back injury as well. He had hurt his back, so he had slipped on the ice and fell. And he got sicker and sicker and sicker. And he was down to 90 pounds. And he was a big guy. He eventually got better. I couldn't believe that the, the human body could be so devastated and still be alive. He later found out that the medicine that had been prescribed to him 
was destroying his body. And so he was religiously taking that, which he thought would heal him. They prescribed these pills, you know, and when he took the pills, the backache, you know, would go away. So, you know, he knew that they were working. But then he, he had all of these other complications, you know, and nobody could figure out really what those were. But, but when he stopped taking the pills, his back pain came back. And they told him that if he had taken them for a few more weeks or months, they'd have killed him. He'd have died. And so he was taking that which he thought was good for him, but it was killing him. There's thousands of God's people who are absolutely redeemed from any element of human merit who are killing themselves in their fellowship with God. Doing that which they think is good for them when it isn't. It's the wrong sphere. It's the wrong medicine. It's the wrong area. It's one that the devil loves to get us back in. The area of legalism. And the devil always says, well, you know, well, that's a good area. You know, that's an area that will keep you from sin. Well, it doesn't. It actually increases it. And the law is the strength of sin. Galatians 5 says the area of the law is a devastating area, but the area of the Spirit is wonderful. The Spirit can't lead us under law. Legalism puts us in the sphere of the flesh. Legalism exalts self. I want to say before I close, you know, i got to point this out to you. God said it. I didn't. Verse 26, chapter 4. Chapter 5, let us not be desirous of vainglory. Vainglory. Now, clearly, you can't just take the 26th verse and say, oh, I know what that means. You know, we shouldn't be desirous of vainglory. You know, it's in a context. Okay, what leads me to be desirous of vainglory? Working in the area of law, legalism, human merit. How can I get it? any vainglory if I work in the sphere of the Spirit. Well, I, I can't. It's all the Spirit. The 26th verse is saying that legalism leads to exaltation of self. The very thing that the legalist says it doesn't do is the thing that it does do. And God points it out. It exalts self. It leads to corruption. No wonder the Word says, not I, but Christ. Galatians 6, 8, we are crucified to it, that world system. Therefore, it attempts to crucify us. 6, 14, it makes nothing perfect. Hebrews 7, 19, it's inferior. It's an inferior covenant. It's not a superior. It's an inferior covenant. Hebrews 8, 6, it's weak. Hebrews 8, 7, it allows us no standing before God. Hebrews 9, Hebrews 9, 8, it's, it's an area of death. Hebrews 9.14, it, it cannot put away sin. It cannot put away sin. Hebrews 9.26, it's not real. It's only a shadow. Hebrews 10.1, it leads us to remember sin. Hebrews 10.1, that's what legalism does. It keeps our remembrance on sin. When God says that they're remembered no more. Hebrews 10.6 and 8, it's not well pleasing to God. He had no pleasure in sacrifice and offerings. He has no pleasure in your human merit offering. They are actually distasteful to Him. The message is distasteful. This is what the angel, the church of Laodicea, spits out. They, or is, that's why He spit out. They're a stench to God, folks. And last of all, it is old and dead. It's not even alive. Now, that was a fast survey. Don't allow yourselves to become captured with a legalistic attitude. You are not in the human merit system. You are in the spirit system. You have been made absolutely complete and perfect in Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, you've been called to liberty. All right. Now don't use that as an occasion for merit. You know what it says. Brethren, you've been... You've been called to liberty. Don't use liberty as an occasion to the flesh. 
I'm going to suggest 99.999% of every Christian I've quoted that verse to said, oh, I know what an occasion of the flesh is. Oh, that's Steve, that's murder, that's infidelity, that's cheating on your income tax. We're free in Christ, but we shouldn't do those things. You know, don't take it out of context. An occasion to the flesh is to fall back to law. I'm going to close by saying I believe it is of much greater concern to God that you turn from the human merit system than it is that you rob a bank. Now, please don't go out and rob a bank. I don't want to get sued for false advice. But you've ripped the verse out of context. Brethren, you've been called to liberty. Don't use liberty as an occasion to go back to law. That's what the text says. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all that You've done for us. We're thankful for the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ that we stand complete and entire before You, that You have presented us holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in Your sight, that You've removed our sins as far as the east is from the west, cast them behind your back, bury them in the deepest sea. That even though they're sought for, they cannot be found. They are, that we're washed as white as snow. And you will remember them no more. Oh, Father, how great is the grace of our God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Love you all, I truly do. Join us in Galatians on Sunday. Rest in Him. Till next time, thanks for watching.